Welcome back to Latin on the Philly Stoop. We left off with a broad introduction for Latin conditions in the last video. Uh, and now we're going to move into the simpler uh, indicative conditions, three of the six conditions. Now, I'm sure you'll remember, because uh, you watched the last video multiple times and internalized all that information, that first video talked about the three indicative conditions, the simple fact present, simple fact past, and the future more vivid. These are just all expressing true things according to a speaker. So, if I should say, if, and hear that if, bringing on the dependent clause, if it is raining, it is wet. Is there is my indicative, present, and uh, it's indicating to you, the listener, that I, the speaker, believe that both of those things are currently true. You hear the label, a simple fact present. Something that's presently true is a fact according to the speaker. If it is raining, it is wet. Now that is your geometry condition, right? Uh, for instance, the transitive property. A is equal to B, and B is equal to C, then C is equal to A. That is a simple fact present condition, the usage of one. Now, these kinds of conditions uh, are appropriate for geometry and perhaps political statements. political statements, you might say? Well, yes. So, um, perhaps you've heard of Euclidean geometry, right? Transitive property. Um, you know who was a really big fan of Euclidean geometry? That's right. Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson read, read Euclid in the original ancient Greek. He was doing geometry in the original ancient Greek, right? Um, and uh, his Declaration of Independence. The, we hold these truths to be self-evident, right? You remember with that one? That is a geometrical proof. The Declaration of Independence is a Euclidean geometric proof for rights. So, pretty important document. These conditions, the geometric tradition, showing up in a very significant way. The two other conditions, the simple fact past and the future more vivid, are still expressing truths or facts according to a speaker. If it was raining, and the was, the indicative, is indicating to you, the listener, that I, the speaker, believe that it indeed rained in the past. If it was raining, then it was wet outside. Those are two very simple clauses there. If it was raining, a dependent condition, then it was wet. What is the conclusion of that true condition? What is the conclusion? That it is wet, or was wet, in this simple fact past. The other one is indicating a situation that um, the speaker thinks is so likely probable that it's almost as if it were a future fact. There's no such thing as future facts. No such thing. Fact, the notion of a fact, is inherently a past idea. So if I say, if it will rain, then it will be wet. The will, the future indicative there in both clauses, if it will rain, it will be wet. Those two future tenses is communicating to you that I believe that it's almost as if it's a future fact, as it's, it's as close to a future fact as it can be in my mind. Those are my indicative conditions. Howdy. Some Latin examples of those? Si latinum lego sum litus. 
If I read Latin, I am happy. Oh, obviously true. The present indicative in both of those clauses, the present indicative in both of those clauses is indicating to you that I think those are both presently true. Whether they're actually true, factually true, that's not what we're talking about. It's always true according to the speaker. So there it is, a simple fact, present. Si latinum lego sum litus. Both clauses, true. The condition that if I am reading Latin, the conclusion, I'm happy. Obviously. These are obvious conditions. Example of the simple fact past. Si latinum legi fui litus. If I read Latin, I was happy. Those things, according to me, were true in the past. Absolutely true in the past. The future more vivid, si latinum legam, ero litus. If I will read Latin, then I will be happy. Both of those things, according to the speaker, are so likely true in the future that it's almost that they're a future fact. And that's what I'm communicating to you with my use of the future. Those are our indicative conditions. Now, learning them, you kind of always learn that both clauses, the if and the then clause, the if and the then clause, they can show up at the beginning of the sentence or the end of the sentence. That they show up like that in real life, that when you read them in a book or a poem, in English or in Latin, that you're going to see a present indicative in both clauses for the simple fact present. Well, you may or you might not. For instance, famous conditions, right? If no one is around you, say, baby, I love you. If no one is around you, is a simple fact present condition. If no one is around you, when the queen says it, say, baby, I love you, I have a condition that has kind of two different forms and verbs in, in either clause. If no one is around you, of course, is sarcastic because she does, in fact, believe there is someone around him, some other woman. And when she says, say, baby, I love you, it's a command, not quite an indicative. So, for instance, in that moment, you have a mixed condition. You have, with your if clause, if no one is around you, that's a simple fact present my present indicative. The only way to tell what condition you're dealing with is by looking at these verbs. Say, baby, I love you. That's a command. It's a mixed condition. Rather tricky. And those are our indicative conditions.